Hello, Cinefans. I'm Kendall Kruver, and this is Watching Classic Movies. There's no star quite like the glittering, charismatic, and forever modern Josephine Baker. In the book, Josephine Baker's Cinematic Prism, my guest Terry Simone Francis explains why Baker's movies, while a small part of a phenomenal career, are an important and enduring part of her legacy. Dr. Francis has also recently introduced a collection of four restored Josephine Baker films, currently streaming on the Criterion Channel. We talked about the remarkable screen presence, agency, and appeal of this unique dancer, singer, and actress. Hello, Dr. Francis. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. The appeal of Josephine Baker on the screen is unique. When I, when I see that opening scene in Princess Tam Tam with her glorious headdress, I gasp. I gasp every time. I just wanted to know, what is your reaction to Josephine Baker on the screen? I really love it. <laughs> I love her screen presence. I find her to be at once glamorous and sophisticated, yet relatable, naive, charming, delightful, and and some you know like a, there's a sparkle there. Um, when I first saw her moving image. I was about 25 or 26, and I think in the image, she might have been about, you know, 22 or 23. So I was, like, looking back at this woman on an adventure in cinema and in France, and I was very, just kind of drawn to her and curious about her. What led you to, to write the book? Well, a few things. I mean, um, as a professor on the tenure track, I am required to write a book <laughs> for promotion. And, and my work on Josephine Baker began as my dissertation research um, many, many years ago uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And over time, that project changed quite a bit. I I don't really remember how the dissertation went, it, it, but over time, the book became, it was kind of shaped by my job as a film professor, and I, I shaped the book around introducing Josephine Baker as a film pioneer, as someone through whom we could understand something structural, something fundamental about the way that movies operate, the way that images operate. I appreciated your concept of a prism to describe the many facets of her life and her personality. Can, can you just try, describe a little bit about, about the idea of Josephine Baker's cinematic prism? Mm, yes. I mean, the, so I said a second ago that Baker is a film pioneer, and I think the pioneery thing about her is this, her cinematic prism. So, like, for, on the one hand, she is um, the, among the first, if not the first, uh, black woman to star in a major motion picture. Um, and she was already a global performer and, um, you know, and quite widely known. And so she brings all of that into, into film. And that film would have been her 1927 film, Siren of the Tropics, a, a silent era film. The cinematic prism is a way of describing the relationship between Baker's screen image, her off-screen image, and the ways that she blended or engaged with her personal story. Uh, through her characters. It's very hard to see one Baker without seeing all the other ones. I think it, one part of that is that there, a lot of her fans will say she's so carefree, like like she's just throwing this performance out there, but, but you emphasize that that's not the case. There's something deliberate in the way that she crafted her image. 
Oh, I think that's right. I think she is um, a highly constructed, yes. uh, carefully put together um, artist. You know, I think she was her own canvas, her own sculpture in many ways. And part of that persona is that she's carefree and she's just natural. She's improvising. She's just sort of doing all the things, but she, you know, she studied real and practiced and decided on her performance. It's so modern the way she crafted herself. Yeah. Do you do you mean um, by being kind of multifaceted and having I, this like mask, but not totally being masked type of thing? A little bit that, how it feels genuine. A little bit that she doesn't have a studio or a Spengali. She's she's powerful. There are all these things that conspire to make her less powerful. To, yeah. to like, well, like she's the star of her films. But then, like as you say, she's marginalized. Yeah. You know, she's she she never gets the guy, and and she's called these names, and yet she's the only reason you're there. And with maybe the exception of John Gabin, you know, I don't know if I said his name, but she, she's the only one that endures is something interesting to see. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting with her because I think, yeah, I think her genuineness, I agree with you, is part of her, uh, as part of her modernity. And this is a moment where people are, um, you know, where the stardom is created both as a figure out there and also a knowable, relatable figure. And Baker, I think, certainly embodies that. And I think with our own culture now of, like, of being, I mean, who among us is not used to being photographed, um, used to thinking of our experience in terms of how we plan to present it, um, whether it's a vacation or a wedding or an engagement. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, any, like any of these, um, you know, kind of personal events to have a, a public manifestation to them. And, and that's, I think that's, we see that with her. Um, there's that moment in, I want to say it's Princess Tam Tam where, there's newsreel footage from, let's call it the real Josephine Baker, um, blended into her film where she is playing a character who is pretending to be a princess. Um, but it's through playing the character of the princess that the entertainer Josephine Baker is both contained and revealed. I mean, you know, that's why the, the prism, you know, it just kind of makes sense. It's just a way of saying there's a lot going on mm -hmm. and we just need to turn it carefully in the light and observe how these images are at angles to each other, how they relate to each other and so forth. And the, the fascination of that complexity. Mm. So, so how much control do you think she had over crafting her image for these movies? You know, I think it was really negotiated. There's a moment that I came across in her, um, in one of the, the biographies. I think it might have been the one by her son, where she says, where she, he's describing a, um, an exchange with her manager, um, Pepito Abitino, manager, boyfriend, sort of husband. And he, she says, referring to what you mentioned about getting the guy, like, why can't Josephine Baker, you know, fall in love and get the, the guy at the end of the story? And he says to her, well, you know, Zuzu or Papitu or Alwina, she's like you. She She's dedicated to her work. She doesn't have time for such frivolities. And she's, you know, she, she doesn't, she's not, she accepts that, you know, plays the role. But it was something that came up a couple of times in her, um, you know, in these biographies that she wanted to be in a different kind of film. Sometimes I feel like 
that is really powerful in that, you know, these characters get to become Josephine Baker. <laughs> you know, they don't, I mean, who wants a boyfriend? <laughs> it can be Josephine Baker. And these guys, I mean, John Gavan is, is fine, but these characters, these are not, you know, these guys are not that, they're not on her level, let's say. No, well, right. I, no. yeah. <laughs> like not at all. Well, like, Prince is Tam Tam in particular. Oh my gosh, that horrible writer. She, oh. She's got this lovely companion who speaks to her soul, and then she wants this guy. You know, and that whole thing with him and his wife, it made me think about a Marx Brothers movie where they have the little part with the lovers and they're singing the song, and you just want it to be over to get back to the 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 meat of the matter, right? And instead of a bunch of goofy guys, it's this beautiful, sexy, glamorous star. You want to see her. You know, what, what are these goofs doing, you know? Yeah. And the thing I find interesting about that is I think that Princess Tam Tam is the one where the camera really is loving her. It, oh, yeah. There's a lot of sparkle in that one. Like, yeah. that's that, the, um, in the credits, I think what, before we started recording, you mentioned the, um, sort of this headdress, and she does a little turn. Yeah. It's really lovely, and I think the camera might be slightly from below, um, just a little yeah. bit, so that you're looking up at her, and she just, um, there's a smoothness always to her surface that is so remarkable and interesting, and yeah, she's, because, you know, she's, she'll be playing, like, in that film, she's just playing a shepherdess. I mean, I don't know what shepherds look like. <laughs> Perfect but. eye shadow and the beautiful creamy skin. <laughs> exactly. It's like I'm not sure that the eyebrows are like perfect art lines. Um, I don't think they have time, you know, are interested in that type of thing. So um, I think I always think that stuff is is funny that her face is always Josephine Baker's face. It's always a perfectly constructed uh, face within these characters. Um, so we're supposed to see her, but then also not see her, and then finally admit that we're seeing her. Yeah, yeah, she, she hits the stage and does something that is only her. And I mean, that's the lovely thing about her movies, really, is that you do get to see her dancing and singing and doing what she really loves. And you can feel yeah. how that is in her soul. Yeah. I mean, talk yeah. about the prism. She She's perfectly capable of comedy. And... I mean, she's the funniest. It translates over time. And sometimes in the drama, she's not really like anybody else. But sometimes in the drama, I do see a little a bit of Clara Beau in the way that those eyes get so tender and wounded. Yeah. I would have loved to have seen more of that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's such a beautiful description. I mean, I'm thinking of some of the moments in Siren of the Tropics, for example, it's like, it's like you can almost see another movie about to emerge. Yes. And then it, do, it doesn't quite happen. Um, and of course, it, uh, in Zuzu, I think especially towards the end, that as you say, tender and wounded, and and it's like, can this film hold that? Can this film? you know, sit with her in that, and, and I, I don't know, I mean, I think we as viewers today are going to, we're going to do that yes. kind of service, or we're going to, you know, to be able to connect, but I, I don't know, I, I'm always, like, revising her movies in my mind <laughs> when I watch yeah. them. You can't help it, it's, you know, and it's from the lens of, you know, looking into the past as opposed to being in it, too. But yeah, there's just this moment, I mean, it, there's things that stick with me. Like oh, in, in Siren me. of the Tropics, there is a moment, I know exactly what you're saying, because it's a moment she just, her, she moves towards the camera, and that, and that was the first time I saw that look. Maybe because it was silent, it, where, where I thought, oh, you know, she was not prancing around, and, you know, she just was never, ever going to be just that. So the prism works so well because she carries all those things and switches back and forth in a way right. th that I feel it's unique. I can't think of anyone else who quite does this. No, neither can I. Um, it's, 
because something like I mean, even just staying with Sign of the Tropics, there there's there's so much comedy, there's so much physical comedy. Um, as you were talking about that moment, I recalled and I was recalling this audience in Chicago um, where there was a screening of Siren of the Tropics. And th- there's a moment in the film where Baker as Paparito like leaps onto, um, onto an armoire, like from the ground, like a cat, like just... Yeah. And she's suddenly up there. And the audience just gasped. We're just sort of like <laughs> they were so into this this thrust. And it gives us a sense of something that actually um uh the poet um Henry Fabdirke called to my attention. Baker's athleticism. Yeah. Just just her physical capability and control and the elegance of her body and how she instrumentalizes her body is on display in these films so like because it's it, we can look at her dancing and see it out you know like an outward entertainment but i think we have to also contemplate what it takes for her to be able to do this you know she's <laughs> um an extremely gifted athlete yeah just the way she'll fling her whole body down yeah. and then jump up again Exactly. And it seems like there's no bones in those arms and knees going back and forth. Yeah. It doesn't yes, seem like she's working. The, right. And it takes muscle to look like you're not working, right? Yeah. I mean, when she does that, I've been, I was obsessed for a long time with this leap that she takes in Princess Tam Tam. It's from very high on the stage, like from one level of the stage, and then she, she leaps. Uh, <laughs> You know, looks like several feet, and she pops right back up. She and it's the landing that communicates an incredible power um, and flexibility, and the, and there's a lightness, a lightness to that. It's really she's yeah. really something in that way, and I think it's just by, you know, my, the 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 goal of my book was like, well, we think we've seen this person, yeah, but have we? Yes. I just, I think for the longest time, it was the woman who marched for civil rights, the woman who did the banana dance, the woman who had all those children. I read a full biography of that rainbow tribe, all those children she adopted before I read her biography. Because all those details can take up your time. You you know, you you almost can't get to the core of it because there's so many beautiful, glamorous things. You think about a man committing suicide at her feet and fighting duels. It's all so exciting. There's a lot there. <laughs> it's like, how did you do this, lady? <laughs> yeah, what a life, huh? What a life. So it, she said, I, I, you know, I wrote it down. What, it, what was it that the, the films, I found it cold. I need warmth. I need people. Now, I got the impression that you don't entirely believe that's the case, that that's why she didn't want to do films. Do you, or, or do, did you? Yeah. Yeah. I, my sense is that the films w- are built around her persona, but they're not really built for her. I think that the, I think if she's saying I found this experience cold, that makes sense to me because I don't. I my sense is that she was not treated well on the set, and she wasn't able to really. In, the films with her thinking about her, the, her, how her character related to other characters, yeah. right? Like, like this love plot. I think she probably, it sounds to me like she wanted to have the love plot be resolved around her rather than her being an instrument for someone else's love plot. Um, so I believe her. I, I think that if I were speaking to her, I would, say, you know, I know you weren't that happy with these films, but I don't know, Ms. Baker, I do see them as, as really quite valuable, and I think you were wonderful, Yeah. Um, despite the, the, the story not being quite good enough for you, I think you, I think you did great, and you're amazing. 
I do think it's interesting what you were saying, like the whole who needs a boyfriend. I mean, it wasn't what she wanted, but it ended up making them really interesting films by her being this full person. Yeah. Maybe she doesn't entirely understand that she is, but you see that she is. Right. Yeah. Well, we're well, we're standing outside of it, and Mm -hmm. you know, um, almost a hundred years or so later, and I think we can bring to her what she wasn't able to see, or we can bring to the film what it, you know, might have been missing. You know, just as an act of care and of respect and also just you know time has gone has gone by but yeah i mean she she crit- you know she wasn't you know thrilled with it and didn't she did make another film after um, princess tam tam called the, the french way is yeah, that the one it was right after it the, yeah i hesitated because i was trying to remember to say the french way and not the american way which i had <laughs> Many times I have said this title incorrectly, um, and um, and I'm super embarrassed about it. But yeah, the French way, um, a film about a, a, a wartime bombing, and she plays a cabaret singer and cabaret owner who um, plays sort of the um, like the she's kind of the like the nurse character yeah. in Romeo and Juliet. They're two families who are at odds in this bunker. You know, we're like this, you know, to protect them from bombing, and the two young people in the family, in the families, uh, fall in love with each other, and she provides a space for them to like have their love thing. So I mean, yeah, that's so. I guess, yeah, I guess I do sort of. I agree with her assessment. I wouldn't disagree with it. I think I just find value nonetheless in the work that she did, and I think that that's work that. You know, as her film viewing community, as her feminist community, as an historian, you know, that I would offer to this um, important figure in, in our culture. I think that that her place in film history is, isn't quite correct at the moment, and it would be nice to see her elevated. It is because things are so centered on Hollywood, I can see the challenge there. But as far as it surviving time and and having its own modern flair like you know from from our view yeah she deserves a lot more there was there's something else about her that really interested me was her um interest in younger women coming up not just acceptance but like um and thinking about the dancer carmen de lavala am i saying that right Uh how she gave her a pep talk and said i'm tired you go out and be the star when they were performing together. Oh, right, yeah. Or, or the story about Diana Ross, how she went up to her, placed her hands on her face, looks at her, clearly giving her the your next vibes. Like, she mm-hmm. she loved these young women and found, you know, I, it made me wonder if she maybe could have done with a partner the way a lot of women in music do today. It seems like it's almost a regular thing for women to partner with each other. I'm thinking mostly music. Like, you know, you've got like Doja Cat, Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, Saweetie. They do these these duets all the time. There's a sisterhood and it's very powerful and you can see how it's it's nourishing to these artists. Because of the way she was with this younger generation, I... I wonder what she would have done if she'd had a partner like that. Ah, oh, that's a lovely thought because she does appear to be singular. Yeah. She often performed by herself, whether singing or dancing. And of course, in the films, she, her friends, if she has a female friend, turns out to be a rival. <laughs> and then she performs by herself. So, like, I think. That would be a fantastic revision of her films, is to give her a real friend and a real partner and to hear her in duet. You know, I would love that, yeah. That's the thing that fascinates me about her, is she's got all the diva energy. But I don't see any diva in this woman at all. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think she doesn't seem threatened by 
other performers or younger performers. I, 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 you know, I just see her as, as a worker. She's just yeah. really into working and into making theater and making yeah. performance. And so, like, if you, if you, if you're into that, then, you know, you just kind of roll. And she's, I mean, she's already Josephine Baker. She's, mm-hmm. what is, is she going to? You know, that can't be toppled. But there's this interview that she gives Canadian broadcast, um, you know, television, where she talks about, well, she talks about her dedication to performing. I kind of lost exactly what it was that I was thinking of. Oh, I guess there's a moment where she says um, that she really tried not to, mm, like, oh, like, overly think of herself as an important person, as a celebrity, you know, she was really very, it seems like she was actually very grounded. Um, now the, in the book by her, by, you know, by Jean-Claude Baker, I think there's a sense of her being really, um, intense and maybe Mm -hmm. a bit of a diva there. Um, but I always say consider the source. I mean, if you're going to be Josephine Baker, you're going to be intense, and people should just yeah. get out of your way and let you be a woman of vision creating. <laughs> yeah, there's just this, you're the star, and you have to protect yourself, and you have to mm-hmm. protect your brand. I think Absolutely. Elizabeth Taylor was the first star where I thought, oh, that's what you have to do. You just have to kind of lay down the law. And I do think that, that she, she did that in, in a way that was just necessity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, before I let you go, tell me, how did this Criterion collection get start? The the, the new collection oh. of films on, on the channel right now. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I guess I'm hosting the Josephine Baker films on the Criterion channel. You know, my relationship with them started with Criterion, with the Criterion channel, um, has happened in two different ways. Um, one is I interviewed Kevin Jerome Everson on the channel, um, last fall. I, it's an off camera interview, so you don't see my face. And I worked with Kim Henderson and Hendrickson, sorry, um, in that regard. And also as the director of the Black Film Center Archive, I worked on a licensing agreement between the archive and the Criterion channel to place an interview with the director, Bill Gunn, on the channel last summer when they you. were um, when they were screening three of his films. I think it was called Three by Gunn, something yeah. like that. Yeah, so those were, so I guess I have a, a, I was there not, you know, in my own interest, but for the BFCA. And then, I don't know, and then I've written a lot about Kevin Jerome Everson, and I think his producer, Madeline Molyneux, suggested me, and... You know, they got to know me and saw that I had published a book on Josephine Baker and expressed interest in maybe screening, showing her films. Because, you know, the films are newly re-released by Kino. They look amazing. Um, Yeah, they weren't available for a while, and they brought those back. So I guess those those things came together. My name was Mm -hmm. in the file, I guess, and then Kino made these films available, and my book on the subject of the bah, 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 bah. she knows what and she's talking like, about <laughs> yeah yeah yes yeah. one does and and i i never done anything like that before so it was a really interesting experience um new skills of yeah. being able to talk about a su- the subject in new and fresh ways and the filmmaker um Ina archer interviews me and i was so honored um to have her presence and prompts and conversations yeah that was lovely yeah yeah oh i'm glad you enjoyed it oh i did i did for us i was grinning and (laughs) and two of my former students um produced the oh yeah they um it was their idea to record me in the um uh, black literature reading room at the public library in indianapolis and um and they set up they did the cinematography and recording and everything it was really very exciting see the see the babies come out of the nest <laughs> yes 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 and it's a sort of a tribute to josephine baker to have this like women's crew 
um, yes. you know, supporting the project. Yeah. Because you know she would have approved. I think so. I think so. And I believe in her spirit being there, too. Yes. I could yes. see her watching on, yes. And I didn't know that you were involved with that Bill Gunn. That was also another wonderful... That, now, that's the same woman that interviewed Kathleen Collins, too. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. Yes, yes. The founding director of the Black Film Center is Archive, that... Phyllis Plotman. Okay. Interviewed them both, Kathleen Collins and Bill Gunn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are very special interviews, both of them. Very, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Francis, for speaking with me today. Just wonderful to get more of your views on this fascinating woman and the life that she led. Oh, it's my pleasure, and it's an honor to speak about Josephine Baker and a delight to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. For show notes, including more information about Dr. Francis and her book, Josephine Baker's Cinematic Prism, go to watchingclassicmovies.com. Thank you for listening. This is Kendall Krufer watching classic movies. Until next time.